everybody to uh, Financial Support for Aging Adults, and this presentation is being sponsored by the Concord Quarter Working Group on Aging Concerns. And I don't know if anybody, here, you know, a lot of folks here know know what that group is, but I'll just I'll just say we've been an official group of the of Concord Quarter for over four years. Um, Evelyn Brownlee of Wilmington Meeting is our clerk, and if after tonight's presentation you want to get involved in that working group, feel free to contact um, uh, uh, Bianca Santini Dumas. She's up there in the corner. I think she's in the corner in everybody's screen, but she's our coordinator. So you can get to her by emailing Concord Quarter at pym.org. Uh, and just a little bit about information about us. We've done uh, a number of uh, presentations, um, you know, uh, some live before uh, the pandemic and some on Zoom. Uh, we've done presentations on staying safe as older adults, housing options in your later years, organizing for life and how to deal with the clutter that we've all accumulated. We've done a presentation on hospice care, uh, and we had a Aging Concerns Facilitators Weekend, at which George was involved, in which a number of, of us were trained in aging concerns issues. So um, we also have on our website, which is at conquercorder.org slash aging concerns, uh, we have a, um, a PDF on a checklist that you should actually look at because it gives you all those all those issues which we have to be aware of as we get older um, and it's a checklist like um, you know doing your will you know finding a, a person who's going to be your medical oh geez somebody help somebody help me with that the power of attorney yeah medical power of attorney and all those other things that's up on our website we also have a um, a senior residence worksheet in Excel. So if you want to make comparisons uh, between the various fees uh, between senior residences that you're looking at, uh, then uh, you could actually go and get that Excel spreadsheet. So, and also a good summary of what our group, group has done is in the July 2021 Concord Quarterly Meeting news newsletter, which was an article written by Lynn Pearsall. Um, all right, now I want to introduce our presenter tonight, George Schaefer. He is PYM's Care and Aging Coordinator. And as many of you know, the PYM Care and Aging Program provides pastoral care support and practical guidance to individuals, families, and meetings in the manner of friends. Um, now, let's see. Uh, as PYM Care and Aging Coordinator, George conducts retreats on topics of aging and consults with meetings and individuals on issues of aging, as well as uh, helping uh, provide PYM financial support to friends of modest means. Uh, by profession, George is a licensed social worker specializing in the area of aging and behavioral health. Before he joined the yearly meeting in 2009, he was a uh, assistant living administrator, a licensed one in Pennsylvania for over 20 years. So we have uh, we have a person of great experience to, to give us this presentation tonight. I regret, not that George regrets, but I regret to inform everybody that George will be retiring at the end of this year. Is that that's right, George? Right on December 31st, you're going to make your escape, and <laughs> we are going to miss you. As I hear many many people said at uh, the continuing sessions last weekend. So, uh, George, we really appreciate uh, you being here. Just briefly, this event grew out of a concern of a subgroup of ours just dealing with senior residences. Um, and uh, we realized that various senior residential communities require a substantial buy-in and monthly fees that can be enormous. Um, and, and we thought it valuable for friends to hear if there were a financial or financial aid supports for this kind of move. We also are interested in finding out if there's assistance for people who wish to age in place. So with that presentation, or I mean introduction, George, I'll turn it over to you. As Rich said, you know, I am the EYM Care and Aging Coordinator, and I am 
looking forward to my retirement at the end of uh, December. Uh, but I am, you know, I will be around and I will certainly be available to consult with people. And, you know, I'm a member of our yearly meeting, so I'm not going very far. And I will be serving yearly meeting as a resource friend in aging. So, um, so you can, you can readily find me if you need to. Um, so tonight we're going to be talking about the funds available through the yearly meeting to support long-term care. And um, there, are, there are a few funds at yearly meeting that are utilized by friends who are uh, in long-term care. And I, I want to stress that most of the applications that come through that I deal with, another, another point of interest is I am the point person for all of the applications that come to the granting groups that provide the grants for aging friends. Uh, when we talk about aging friends, we're talking about friends 60 or 62, depending upon the grant and the fund. Um, so 60 or 62 and over. So that, that's, that's what's classified as an aging friend. For the most part, we're talking about members of the yearly meeting although we'll talk about the Greenleaf Fund a little later on. Um, and that is unique in that it allows for uh, persons who are um, in sympathy with friends. So that's a, that's a phrase and, and we've defined that very carefully. Um, it also allows for those to be considered in sympathy with friends who are relatives of members of the yearly meeting. So the Greenleaf Fund, and I'm gonna, you know, as I said, I'll talk more about it, but the Greenleaf Fund is the major source of funds available to aging persons in our yearly meeting. Um, there is another fund called the Aging Granting Group, uh, and that is a, a granting group that administers many different funds that have been established. You know, um, the, uh, the joke is that Quakers don't endow uh, stained glass windows or candlesticks. They create funds for purposes. So um, the yearly meeting and even my meeting, and I'm sure maybe your meeting, have many little funds. So um, the Greenleaf is our big fund. It has a corpus of about 12 to 14 million. Its income is about half a million dollars a year. And, um, and thus far, we've probably distributed since 2009 when the fund was established, uh, $2 million to, uh, to various friends. Um, so I have a presentation and um, I'm gonna you know, give you a lot of information. I'm gonna screen share right now. Okay. So PYM financial support for aging friends. And, um, and again, in my role at yearly meeting, and in yearly meeting, what, what many, many people are not aware that the yearly meeting is a granting institution. We give away millions of dollars a year in funds. I mean, not only for aging, but for other things. So when friends think about the yearly meeting, yeah, there's the program part, the part that supports annual sessions and the work that I do, but then there's a whole business office that administers and makes sure that funds are distributed to friends who are applying to the to, for grants. And we have a, a huge grant making apparatus and um, the granting committee of yearly meeting oversees all the various granting groups. Just put that out there. Because sometimes when friends, when we look at the budget of yearly meeting, we're thinking, wow, that's, that's a big organization. But we do serve as a, almost like a um, philanthropic organization for the various funds. Most of the funds, the funds that are invested in endowments are held by Friends Fiduciary. Okay, now, oh, there we go. I'm trying to advance my slides and figure that out, here we go. So um, the reality and the denial of aging. 
And, um, you know, the reality is that due to medical advances, we're living a lot longer. Um, 70 to 80% of us will require an average of two to three years before our deaths of, of assisted care, uh, long-term care. And I'm going to get into what, you know, we're going to break out that term long-term care into its component parts. And the reality is that most of our medical expenses will, will be used in the last two years of our lives. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, the friends that are, the majority of friends that apply to the yearly meeting for help are, are usually approaching that sort of phase where their personal expenses have been spent down, another expression we use in aging, and now they need assistance for that last maybe five, two, five, maybe 10 years of their lives. Um, and now I put here, you know, and the denial. The, the denial is that most of us think that we will not be the ones that need long-term care. You know, most of us think we'll be that 20% of Americans who don't, or 20 to 30% that don't need long-term care. But even if we're aging at home, aging in place, we will need um, care and assistance in those final years of life. And there we go. Okay, so. so the issue then becomes planning for long-term care. And as I emphasize in all of my talks on aging, um, planning and at least having an idea of what your trajectory will be for aging, sharing that with your family and friends and, and financial advisors, letting people know what your plan is, is of key importance. Because what can often happen is we go into medical crisis, we have a fall, we have a, some kind of problem with our, our health, our body, um, and then we move into the medical system. And if we haven't planned, and if we haven't told people what it is we want, that system can take charge. And then we are not as active. And of course, you know, in terms of quality of life as one ages, having control and knowing what you're gonna be doing next, even if you're somewhat impaired is, is an incredible, well, actually it's an incredible help for any kind of impairment that you might encounter, especially cognitive impairment. So long-term care planning starts with you. And when we talk about long-term care, um, there's no formula for long-term care. It's all about the person. It'll be different for each person. Um, it'll be tailored to your needs. Again, that's that need for planning. Um, long-term care doesn't start with an institution. Uh, we were talking just a little bit earlier and, 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 and Rich mentioned the prices of the institutions, but I like to, sort of move it out of the institutional realm and, and not think of institution as much as, okay, how am I gonna, how am I gonna age? Like, what am I gonna do? What's the, you know, uh, and, and of course I need to think about institutions and payment, but, but what do I want? And, um, you know, so, so when, you're, when you're starting to think about long-term care, again, that trajectory, you know, you'll live independently, then you may need assistance, how will that happen? Uh, then you may need more assistance. Um, what if there's cognitive impairment um, or a major medical uh, diagnosis, um, a dementia? And you know, mild cognitive impairment is usually what most of us experience as we age. Uh, but things like Alzheimer's or other uh, serious dementias, they are more serious medical conditions as well, um, and they represent a medical syndrome. So how will you, you know, how will you be, how will you prepare for that? All right. What is long-term care? <laughs> and here's the, the, the visual didn't come out well, but uh, long-term care is variable and it depends on your need. It could be medical care provided in, by skilled staff. It could be personal care provided by skilled staff. And I like to, you know, Personal care is often, you know, that is administered in what's called an assisted living facility. 
Now, Quakers have been on the vanguard of long-term care. Uh, the Quaker boarding home movement started over 100 years ago. Um, the Hickman, um, you know, Friends, Friends Home and Newtown, these institutions were started in the 1870s, 1880s. Um, the Jeans family, Anatine Jeans, uh, if you go to most of the uh, Quaker assisted living facilities that were at one time personal care boarding homes. So they went from personal care boarding homes uh, to personal care homes to assisted living. And that's all the same type of care. It's congregate care, you're living with others um, and you're being assisted in the day-to-day -day living. So again, housing, household responsibilities, financial support, community environment and relations. And again, assisted living is, there's that emphasis on community. But these are the, you know, these are the issues when you look at long-term care, you say, okay, so there's medical needs, personal care, housing, where will I live? How will I, you know, how will I afford it? And then what's the community that I'm gonna be part of? And do I, how do I feel about being part of the community? And one thing that I, you know, when I, having done this job uh, for almost 13 years now and having done work previously, um, and we know that Quakers were in the vanguard of what's called the continuing care retirement community movement. And um, Folkways in Gwinnett was the, one of the first in America. And when, when Quakers decided to create Folkways, they didn't do it because they didn't want to be a burden to their children. They did it because they were Quakers and wanted to be in community. So a lot of the Quaker facilities were the impetus behind it was, hey, we're aging, we want to be together. And um, there may have been some, you know, there may have been some desire to not burden one's children, but there's also that spiritual ideal of living in community continuing so that a lot of the Quaker CCRCs uh, like Kendall Folkways and Penswood and Medford Lees, you know, they have a meeting for worship, they have a pastoral care committee, they have all of the, the um, you know, the, the structures that friends are familiar with. And so having, you know, that's another issue is when you age, what about your pastoral care? What about your spiritual life? Spiritual life in aging becomes very important. Um, and one of the things I often talk about is what's called gerio transcendence. Um, So uh, I hear somebody's somebody's not unmuted. I can hear something going on there. So if you could just make sure you're muted. Um, so as I mentioned, long-term care may be provided in a variety of settings. You can do it in one's home. It's called aging in place or the home of a relative um, in a congregate setting. And that could be group independent living, an independent living arrangement. I mentioned uh, friend's home in, in Newtown, they also have a village. There's friends home, there's friends home and village. And the village is an independent congregate setting. Um, there's assisted living and assisted living again, you know, that's that catch all for personal care home um, or, you know, what used to be called, um, you know, a Quaker boarding home. Um, and then it could be in a skilled, nursing facility, or, and then it could, you know, include hospice care or palliative care. And, um, and while you may decide, okay, I'm living at home or I'm living with my, my daughter, um, you'll still need to think about these settings because most of us will wind up at some point in hospice or in palliative care as we approach the end of our lives. So I thought it would be real helpful if you had the, you know, the insider jargon for, um, for long-term care speak, as they say. Um, many of us don't, you know, we kind of put these terms out of our mind because they're not, when we're young and healthy, they're not relevant to our lives. And when I go to speak to meetings, if a meeting invites me to come and speak about aging, you know, as soon as I get my stuff all set up, all the young people, the people under 60, all leave the room 
and uh, I, I don't personalize it because they're not in the frame of mind to think about what is coming. Um, but acute care, when we talk about acute care that's provided in a hospital, subacute care is often what's called a rehabilitation. Assisted living, I mentioned that, it's a wide variety. Assisted living facilities are not regulated in the same way that a nursing home or a hospital would be. Um, most people move into assisted living because they need help with their activities of daily living, the ADLs, the ordinary everyday tasks of living, bathing, cooking, dressing, et cetera. Um, my mother is 90 years old and um, I have helped her through this and, and, and you know, on, on a personal basis, um, not a professional way, although, you know, uh, she's happy to have that. Um, but, you know, she was living independently until about 88 when cooking um, just became too much for her. And so um, she moved to assisted living. Um, and then assisted living will also help with the instrumental activities. And again, that's paying bills, shopping, driving, getting to appointments and doing that kind of thing. A skilled nursing facility is basically what used to be called a nursing home. Um, and it provides subacute skilled care. So you're not, um, and, and, you know, and the word transfer uh, in, in long-term care speak, it has two, two meanings. Um, it could be transfer institutionally, and it also is about personal transfer, one's ability to move about. Um, even with, uh, you know, being ambulatory, as one ages, just moving about, uh, doing the daily activities is, um, you know, can be a challenge. Um, the institutional transfer is that during the course of our aging, during the course of our long-term care, we can move, we will move from various of these settings as, as need and circumstances dictate. So, so then, you know, I give you this overview and that, so then it becomes a question of timing. Like the question, why change your current living arrangement? You know, things are pretty good, why, why, why do that? So being able to assess your needs, knowing when to assess your needs, um, knowing if you're gonna change locations, if you're gonna move somewhere other than where you've been living uh, in your early post-retirement. Um, and then how do you remain independent? Um, and it will involve asking for help. So the more help you can ask for of friends and family and professionals and doctors and whomever uh, is there for you, um, the more, again, the more you'll take control and the more you'll be able to feel uh, more competent, but you are gonna have to ask for help. Now, how do you assess your needs? Um, you know, that as we age, that takes a lot of humility. Um, it's usually the people around us that are going to, to assess our needs. And I'll never, you know, I, I, I'll share, um, you know, with when my in-laws were in their, I guess, mid-70s, uh, they said to my wife and I, well, when we're, you know, when we're ready, you guys need to tell us. And when they were in their early 80s, we sat down and said, hey, you know, we think it might be time. This big house is, you know, a lot and other things. And they were highly insulted. They, they, they thought we were, you know, we were, saying things that we weren't, we were just trying to be helpful. But how are you going to do this assessment? How are you gonna know when to move? Um, how are you gonna know when, you know, how are you going to put yourself in the hands of another? And we've talked earlier, uh, Rich mentioned, you know, medical power of attorney, financial power of attorney. Um, we're not gonna go into that tonight, but, but all those decisions, what are called um, end of life decisions, uh, which will need to be moving concurrently as, as we go through this aging process. So um, long-term care in different settings, uh, aging in place. Someone said tonight they, they plan to age in place, so that's great. Uh, continuing care retirement community, I mentioned that, Folkways, Kendall, 
Crosslands, um, you know, Longwood, uh, that, that, that's a special um, type of community arrangement. Um, independent living, assisted living, tiers, and then plus, because assisted living has tiers, um, and there are price points for each tier. And the tier is done, the tier that you need is determined usually by a social worker who does an assessment um, of your need. And then there's multi-generational living, co-housing. Some friends have figured out that, you know, one way to, to stay younger and to have sort of input of others is to live in this congregate co-housing. And then I put here a NORC. A NORC is a naturally occurring retirement community. So these happen more in urban areas where um, there's an apartment building or there's a neighborhood of people who are aging in place and they form a community. And there are other, there are various uh, institutions that'll help them do that. There's something called village to village. Um, there's the village model that came out of uh, Beacon Hill in, in Boston about 20 years ago. All right. So, so how will how will all this get funded? Um, so there's public funding, and most people, when you turn 65, you have to, you should, you must apply for Medicare. You don't have to, of course, um, but if you don't, uh, that you could have some penalties held against you when you do decide to apply if you're after, if it's after your 65th birthday. Um, Medicaid is, you know, Medicare is a universal system. Everyone that has worked at some point is eligible. Medicaid is a means tested. It's done state by state. Um, and, but each, each county has a federally funded Office on Aging. And um, the Office on Aging also may have funds available, especially uh, Office on Aging does have in-home care funding for in-home care. So if you're, if you're aging in place and you need to have um, personal care assistance twice a week for four hours in the afternoon, the Office on Aging might be able to assist you with some of that funding. And then there's private. So the big, you know, the big private uh, resource for uh, long-term care is long-term care insurance. Now, long-term care insurance, unless you work for a large corporation, um, you, you do have to go out and purchase it. Um, it is not cheap and it becomes more expensive the older you get, of course. Um, and many people that move into continuing care retirement communities also have long-term care insurance so that as they move through. Now, the continuing care retirement community is a special community um, in that they're, you're buying an insurance product basically. And they're saying to you, okay, you can come in to our community, you can live independently. Of course, we're gonna be making assessments of your abilities. You'll then move into assisted living. You'll then move into skilled care. You'll go to hospice, palliative care, and then your life, you, will, you know, you, your life will end. So they're, they're, they're selling you that insurance product that they will be there to take care of you. So if you do have a fall and go to a community hospital and then need some rehab and go to a, a, a subacute place, a subacute facility, when you're well, then you go back to your residence at the, uh, at the CCRC. PYM grant me. Um, so I mentioned Aging Assisting Granting Group, Aging Assistance Granting Group. And the Aging Assistance Granting Group oversees a, a bunch of funds, a lot of little funds. Um, and we'll talk more about that. And then the Greenleaf Granting Group. Now the Greenleaf Granting Group um, was established in 09. Um, I was there on the underground floor for that. Um, and the Haddonfield Quarter in, in South Jersey had a personal care home like the Hickman in Moorestown. But unlike the Hickman, 
they decided not to modernize. So the Hickman modernized, moved into personal, uh, you know, personal care through assisted living, um, and they were just around the corner from the Barclay, and the Barclay, which is now part of the Kendall Group, uh, provided the um, skilled care. So you could go from Hickman, and as your, you know, as your need uh, developed and as you declined, you would then move to Barclay. Um, but so the Greenleaf was a, a facility. It was sold. It was sold to Morristown Friends School. It's now an administrative building in the, for the school. But the sale and the endowment were put into a fund, and that fund is available to, as I mentioned, to um, to members. So there's Anna T. Jeans. Uh, the Jeans family were actually, you know, I work at Friends Center, that, that whole corner, that whole block of, um, or that corner block was uh, purchased by Anna T. Jeans. Uh, the Jeans family were um, involved in the railroads in the mid 19th century. Uh, there were four Jeans children, none of them married, all of them became philanthropists. So. Throughout the yearly meeting, you'll see genes this and genes that. And, and Anna T was the, the one with concern for aging. Um, so um, the Aging Assistance Granting Group makes need-based grants to individuals. Now, this is something that, and the reason I wanted to put all this in the context of long-term care is that when granting groups look at what is being requested, they look at need uh, and what, uh, you know, and I mentioned Medicaid, which is a healthcare for uh, people. And it's also means tested, meaning means, what are your means? What level are they in terms of their degree above or below the poverty base? And then, um, so the granting group then makes an assessment and then, um, you know, and then we'll either grant or not grant. Um, and members of the granting group appointed by the granting committee. And then I am, I am staff for, for that committee. All righty. So these are some of the AGG funds, uh, Anarchy Genes, the biggest, um, the Stroke Heart. And you'll see this, this fund came to us through the sale of the Stapley in Germantown, which is no longer under the care of the yearly meeting. We sold it to the Methodists back in, I think, 2010. Um, and this little fund came over with it. But this fund can assist elderly persons living in friends facilities. Now, these other funds, in a way fund, um, which was a fund that came through um, with the closure of Friends Hall at Fox Chase, which was also part of Jean's Hospital. All of this is um, a little bit arcane, but it, it um, and those funds are often used for someone in skilled care because they come from that Jean's Hospital. And there's the Satterwaith and the Hallowell Fund, um, the Albertson Fund, the Cadbury, the, uh, the Shepherd, and um, Pensbury, and then there's Agent Granting Fund. And these funds, for the most part, the Albertson especially and the Cadbury, they're the biggest. And they, their language talks about helping friends remain in their own homes. So unlike Strokart, which can be applied for, for folks living in facilities, um, the, these, the four funds, you know, from Albertson down to Pensbury, the language is pretty clear that they're for for assisting friends living in their own home. So I just put that out there because there are these precatory restrictions on the, on the, on the money. So how do you apply? Um, let's see if I put that in. So friends who, as I mentioned, um, we, we have also, uh, the aging grading group has more flexibility because of the number of funds and the language uh, and many of the, some of the language comes from, of course, the 19th century. But it's a fairly, there's a, there's a bit of flexibility there. Um, 
and friends can apply. Uh, you can contact me if you, if you, you know, just contact POM Care Aging Coordinator. And when I'm gone, there will be an aging coordinator um, to replace me. Um, and applications can be also made on behalf of family members. Um, and they can be made by the pastoral care committee of the meeting or the retirement community itself, the retirement facility. And that's a unique, you know, allowing, say, the Hickman to make an application directly through the fund for one of its residents is, is fairly unique. Um, the committee also makes pocket money grants, and those are for friends who are, it's a little, it's a little dated that expression, pocket money. Um, and then, you know, there you see there are no deadlines for when to apply. Um, and if you want the, you know, the aging assistance guidelines, I, you can find them on the, uh, on pym.org. Much of the information, I mean, not the, you know, the, the softer things about uh, long-term care, but, but the information about the granting groups and the funds and what they're, the folks they're targeted to help, all that information is on, on our website, pym.org. This is a, uh, yeah, this, that's a, what happens if you, uh, let's see what happens. Oh, here you go. So here we are. Um, this is, this is a PDF on, on, uh, on our website. And, uh, and so it describes the type of grants, monthly pocket money, individual one-time monthly, ongoing monthly grants. Uh, grants. Okay. So the green leaf, again, there's a picture of the green leaf. Um, the statement of values, the ministry of the green leaf granting group is guided by values that guided the founding and operation of the former green leaf boarding home for more than a century, caring, compassion, confidentiality, respect for all residents of the home. And um, Alice Paul lived to be 100 years old and she, she died at the green leaf. And um, <coughs> There's a lot of different stories, very spicy, salty stories about Alice Paul living at the Greenleaf. Uh, <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, many of the, the homes that were started in the 19th century were started for women who were in the first wave of feminism. So the Hickman was for Quaker school moms who were tired did not marry, did not want to live with family, and then moved into that. So it's interesting, the connection between early feminism and the Quaker boarding home movement. Uh, but I won't say anything more about that. So the Greenleaf provides grants and loans to elderly Quakers. So grants and loans. Um, so sometimes people do take a loan against their, their assets, usually their real estate. And, and in that way, the Greenleaf has, has functioned as a reverse mortgage lender. Um, although we don't do anything involving lawyers, it's all done through um, letters of understanding and agreement and meeting with family and, and talking about needs. So we try not to make it legalistic. Um, and those in sympathy with friends who are of modest means. Now there's that modest means, basically the, the need, you know, the need for assistance. Um, and it's for housing needs, ongoing medical, uh, and then maintenance or living costs. So if you're living in your own home and you have a maintenance need, uh, or you need a new car, or you need to, uh, you know, do something to maintain uh, your current situation, also just living costs. All right. So. Greenleaf assistance grants are made to individuals only. The Greenleaf does not grant to organizations or institutions. Um, applications are considered according to the following priorities. Quakers who are members of a monthly meeting in Haddonfield Quarter, and that they get first priority. Uh, Quakers who are members of another monthly meeting of Philadelphia Yearly Meeting, uh, second priority. And then those who are in sympathy with friends and live in the geographic area defined by Haddonfield quarterly meeting or the yearly meeting. I should, I should add that. Um, so there, there is another group under there that uh, 
includes everyone in the yearly meeting. So if you were in sympathy with friends and you decided to move to Oregon, um, you would not be eligible for the green waiver as it's, you know, as it's um, language describes it now. Um, but if you were a member of PYM and you moved to Oregon and you were in long-term care and you needed assistance, you could apply to the yearly meeting. And actually we've had a number of people that have lived, that have decided to relocate in their retirement, maintain their, their um, membership in their, in their Philadelphia yearly meeting, monthly meeting, and continue to be eligible. So for the purposes of the Greenleaf Fund, and sympathy means, well, non-Quakers who can be a parent, spouse, domestic partners. You can see this language is a little dated. Um, it was written 10 years ago and things have changed. Uh, but, but um, you know, so that there's that. Um, and you can have worked or volunteer a minimum of, of five years in a Quaker organization within the geographic area, again, defined by the Philadelphia Yearly Meeting. Um, applications for grants from persons in category A that would be members are considered before. Now, thus far, um, the Greenleaf has a lot, you know, a lot of income that it generates every year, and it has never um, turned down anyone that meets the requirements. So we're it's still underspending. It's um, yeah, okay. All right. So I those those are questions and answers. I will stop the screen share. Okay. Let's see. Uh, George, it looks like we didn't get any questions through the chat. So that means I think if people would like actually let me ask a question if you're able to to do this. Um what about Medicaid? I know that that's come up in our discussions in our group quite a bit. People may not understand the process of applying for Medicaid and how you have to spend down your resources. Could you talk a little bit about that? Sure, I can talk a lot about that. <laughs> um, most of us, um, I mean, I, I have long-term care insurance, um, but most of us are going to self-insure our long-term care, meaning it's gonna come from our savings. And we're gonna pay as need arises, we're gonna to go to our savings and we're gonna pay for the care we need. So that means that that money is gonna be drawn down. It's gonna you know, dwindle. When it dwindles to the point of um, real, uh, you know, close to, uh, let's say, the poverty level in in the U.S. and the the granting groups, the Greenleaf and Aging, they use a guide of 350 percent above the poverty line. So everybody knows in America, the poverty line has not been changed since like 1968, some ridiculous thing like that. And so when you talk about need and assessment. It's always about percentages above the poverty line. So Greenleaf is probably going to, given inflation and things that are going on, we're probably going to move it up to 400%. So, but if you are even 200% above the poverty line in terms of your income now, because you've spent down your savings, you are eligible for Medicaid. Um, but Medicaid wants you to have spent down your assets. And if you are, um, you know, many people that apply to Greenleaf, they say, well, um, I'm not spending on my assets. I'd like to get money from, from Greenleaf and from Medicaid uh, because I want my assets to go to my children. Now that cannot, that's not allowable. Only if you plan, say seven or eight years before you know you're gonna need um, Medicaid, if you, if you establish trust, move your assets into, a, into an irrevocable trust, meaning you can't take it, but trustees can. Um, if you don't do that, you will have to spend your money. And most of us will 
probably at that point be in some kind of skilled care and the facility will know that you don't have the money to pay and they will make application to Medicaid. Usually they'll make it for you. Well, they'll bring your family in or your power of attorney and say, okay, um, you know, given the income, given inflation, given the spending down, given the liquidation of all assets, um, the person now is, is, has, is putting together a, a package. So part of that package is their social security, that'll never end until they die. If they have a pension, that'll never end until they die. If they have an annuity, that'll never end until they die. And then the difference will be made up by Medicaid. So that's how that would work. I mean, I just, I just gave you the example of how my mother, my mother's in skilled care, skilled nursing care, and that's how her monthly bill is being paid through that, those four payment mechanism. Now, if the annuity gets spent down, Medicaid will pick up that. Um, the Social Security and, the, and, the, and the, her pension you know, will just continue to come into her bank account. I write a check each month for that, you know, for the difference between what Medicaid can pay, what the annuity is paying, and then those other two pieces. So, so most of us, I mean, unless we've, um, you know, unless for some unfortunate reason we become impoverished, most of us will use Medicaid as a as an add-on to help with the package that the nursing home needs in order to provide the care. So that that's the that's the Medicaid story. And and you know, Medicaid does if you have like my mother had some considerable liquid assets and um, you know the nursing home they did an analysis and they said okay so you know there's thirty thousand dollars here uh, that you know if if you don't spend it Medicaid will take it and the only way you can spend it as I could spend it as her son and and m my brothers and I um, we created um, funeral arrangements for ourselves through an irrevocable trust. So you can, so all of my, I, I'm gonna be buried in a pine box in Laurel Hill West Cemetery in Philadelphia, overlooking the Schuylkill River and the expressway. Um, <laughs> and it's all paid for, but it was paid for through the spending down of my mother's final assets. And that was allowable under Medicaid. And so, so that, that's how Medicaid will work for most of us. George, just a follow on question. Could, can we count on if we move into a facility that there will be a social worker at the facility who will understand this process and kind of shepherd us through? Is that something we should assume? Uh, you can, if you're, if you're in a Quaker facility, you can absolutely assume it. If you're in, if you're in any, any facility, you can absolutely assume it because they want to get paid. You're going to be in a private, you know, for the most part, you want to, you want to be in a private nursing facility. You don't want to be in a public facility. Um, and, and unless you were an impoverished person, I don't want to, you know, denigrate the public facilities. But if you've been going through this, these steps as I've described them, you'll probably be in, say, if you're in, in, if you're in a CCRC, or, but you'll probably have enough money to move into nursing care and afford it for a few years. Um, if you have insurance or self-insuring, but then you'll re then you'll have spent it down, and then you know most nursing homes will keep you. They're not going to you know they're not going to show you to the curb. They'll keep you, and they're going to want to get paid, and so they will apply for. Yeah, I just was um, working with somebody who um, the the nursing home didn't really know. What her assets were because she had come in in an acute situation, went into the rehab, then back to the nursing, and they went ahead and applied for the person, and um, it got approved, and the person had assets, and so it was it had to be given back. But um, yeah, they're not going to be they're not going to be shy about applying because they want to get their money. Okay, great, George. Thank you. Uh, I got a, I have another question here in the chat. Uh, but I just want to point out that Lynn 
um, put out on the chat that the current poverty guidelines for a family of four is 26,005 or 12,880 for one person, 17,420 for two. Right, right. So, and so, eligibility would be two hundred percent above that, I guess, right? Right. So if you do, if you so if you do the math, if you work back from Lynn's figures and do the math for a single person, that means that um, the Greenleaf guidelines and and yearly meeting granting aging guidelines are about thirty six to thirty eight thousand dollars a year. So if you're in your retirement, if you've spent down and now you have a you have a an income of about thirty-six thousand, you're eligible for Greenleaf and aging. So, because we're we're about three hundred fifty percent above that for an individual, which comes out to approximately thirty-four five or something like that. Okay, great. Thank you, George. Yeah. Um, here's a question, and you might want to take this time to kind of put put in what we were talking about before we came on. Are you aware of financial assistance or help offered by uh, the Quaker CCRCs or any other quarters? Um, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, Abington Quarter, my quarter, um, had a personal care boarding home, Quaker personal care boarding home in Norristown, and it closed and sold that. And so Abington Quarter has what's called an Abington uh, you know, care and aging fund, and it's open to all members of the quarter. Um, the, you know, the many of the funds, many of the many of the long-term care facilities that are Quaker have a Quaker residence fund, but it's not used to get in. You wouldn't use. You couldn't say, "Hey, I understand you guys have a a Quaker assistance fund. I'd like to use it to get in." It's used once you're in. So once you're in, and as you're aging and spending down, um, then that fund will kick in, and um, you know, and and they all have. I mean, Medford Lee's, um, Folkways, they all have. I'm I'm not sure. I mean, you know, um, so 20 years ago, there were a lot of providers in the field of assisted living. Um, like there were providers in nursing care. And then as things have corporatized, the number of small places have dropped out. They've been, they've been subsumed under larger corporations. As Quakers, we're kind of lucky that one of the winners has been Kendall Corporation. So Kendall's now a national player and they've got facilities and they're still, you know, still a Quaker organization, Quaker founded. Um, and they, they do try to abide by um, the, the principles and the, 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 the former, um, you know, there were Quakers in our yearly meeting, uh, Lewis Brown, some of you may remember him. He was, you know, he was out at Kendall, the Brown family. Um, so, so we, you know, Quakers did sort of we do have a national presence in Kendall Corporation, but our other our other facilities are mostly located in this area and out on the west coast. There are a few. Now, if you're if you're interested in knowing what the Quaker facilities are, there is an association called Friends Services for the Aging, and you can you can Google FSA info i n f o dot o r g, and their website will come up, and you can get a complete listing of all the Quaker affiliated. And what Quaker affiliated means, there's no, you know, that we're not, you know, we're not uh, a pyramid hierarchy. Uh, but what it means is that the Quaker values um, will be practiced and that at least 50% of the board members will be Quaker. So that's, that's when we call, when we call an institution these days, that is an independent institution, what we're, what we're really talking about is the board, that the board, um, you know, that at least 50% of board members have some kind of Quaker affiliation. Most places require them to be members. They will make an exception for an attender who brings a special expertise. So, um, 
but you know, like the Quaker schools, like our Quaker schools, um, you know, I think Folkways has the most Quakers, you know, the largest number of Quaker residents. Um, and then there are varying degrees and um, of Quaker presence. Um, but one of the other things, one of the things that's interesting, um, speaking of the last question, um, Quakers need pastoral care in Asia. And Penswood Village, which is, you know, on the campus of George School, um, the, the, there's a large Presbyterian group there. They were unhappy that there was no chaplain. And so they hired a Presbyterian chaplain to come in. And, you know, there, there's a Quaker presence there, but we, you know, we, it may not be that the folks that are there are the folks that, have provided pastoral care at their meeting. So, um, so sometimes a Quaker long-term care community, CCRC, will welcome someone with a strong pastoral care background that can provide that kind of uh, ministry to the, to the group. So we're, we're you know, it, it's a unique situation that we started these groups, as I mentioned earlier, uh, these long-term care facilities were started with a spiritual incentive, a spiritual motive. And, but then that generation passed away um, and sustaining our spiritual life. And many people, um, I remember going to Penswood Village um, and they, they had a problem. Penswood Village had a problem after 2010 and then the 2012 you know, financial crisis because they started marketing to New York City and other large urban areas. And people were coming and not knowing that there was a Quaker institution and saying, well, why are we having this moment of silence before dinner? Like, and they'd say, well, that's our way of, you know, that's, a, that's our way of, that's Quaker grace, as my son would say. We stare at our plates in silence for a few minutes before we eat. <laughs> that's a little joke. But, uh, um, but there was no one. So that culture, the Quaker culture, how we do pastoral care, the communal aspect of our spirituality, that is... You know, that is something that needs to be kept alive, in my opinion. And if you do go to a, you know, as I, you know, as I always suggest, if, if there's a community that interests you, go there, find out, talk to people, have lunch. Don't let, don't let the fact that, you know, the, the price fee structure might look out of your range. Go there, talk to people. Let them know what you bring. Let them know that you're a Quaker. Let them know that this is a Quaker institution. You're a Quaker. This is where you belong. And, you know, you might not be able to afford it, but, um, you know, talk, negotiate. Um, I said earlier to, to Rich, you know, oftentimes, especially with CCRCs, it's kind of like buying a car. You know, you, you negotiate. Like, what's the state of your health? How long do you think you'll live? What, what kind of assets do you have? Um, what's your family arrangement? So you, you really need to explore all of these things. And then of course, will you like it there? Now, the personal inventory that we, I, I often, you know, if you're an introvert who likes to read and be alone, being in a long-term, being in a CCRC um, might not be your cup of tea. Or, you know, you, 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 because there are, you know, activities and it's a different kind of, it's like, you know, it's like college. It's like CCRCs are like, you know, there are lectures, there are trips, there are all kinds of things going on. And, um, you know, so, so you should explore and talk to people, get to know the community, get to know what you're doing. The other thing is if you're going to age in place, you probably don't want to relocate somewhere. Like if you were a young retired person, you might want to go to Boulder, Colorado. But the older you get, your network of support, your community, your doctors, your lawyer, your accountant, all that stuff, you want to have that stuff accessible. You don't want to move when you're in your late 70s to Boulder and start to have to make all those connections. Um, and I, I know of some very unfortunate situations where, you know, people always had a dream in their retirement, they would go to 
some remote place and now they're in a remote place and they're retired and they don't have many friends. Um, you know, they're enjoying the scenery, uh, but their social supports and their community are not there to, to, to wrap around them. And, um, and that's gonna be really important. Um, you know, and especially, you know, the other thing I should mention is that, you know, if you are gonna age in place, um, that your meeting community is gonna be a very important part of your, part of your life. Great. Uh, just a minute, Gary, I'll call on you in a second. George, one important point we were discussing before, and people may not be aware of it, that it may be a buyer's market when you actually go to the director of admissions at, at, a, at a specific place. Do you want to just talk briefly about that? I thought that was a good point you made. Well, as I mentioned, you know, as, as Rich mentioned, I was a personal care administrator uh, licensed by the state. Um, and so that, that business model depends on the number of beds that are occupied. So the number of beds that are occupied, that's the income that I'm gonna to get to run my facility. So if there's a downturn in the real estate market and everybody decides to stay put and not sell their houses and, and move into assisted living, then my, because the other thing is, you know, just to, be very clear to you about the whole thing is people are dying all the time in facilities. You know, that's, they're going there and that's, you know, that it's usually, that's the last move that you're going to make. Um, you know, you're not going to say, okay, well, maybe I'll go do this. And, you know, that, that's it. You're there and then you're going to die. So as people die, beds become available. If people are not willing to come in for some reason because of a downturn in the market, then my occupancy starts to go down and I start to panic. And then I offer people discounts. Say, hey, come on in. We're going to waive, we're going to waive the, you know, the, the down payment. We're going to waive that for you, or we're going to cut it by 50%. Um, you may have heard, you know, maybe more like eight, eight, six years ago, um, when people were holding on. Now the, the interesting that thing that's happened in long-term care is. Um, so the age for someone to enter Folkways 50 years ago was 67 because men died at 72 and women died at 74. So now um, people are coming into long-term care in their early 80s. That's, that's the average age now is early 80s. But you know, it was interestingly, I remember when Folkways had to repave all of its walkways and they found that no one was using their tennis courts because it wasn't 67 year olds coming in to play tennis. It was 85 year olds coming in who had no interest in playing tennis. So, um, you know, so demographics, what's happening financially, when are people moving in? All of those variables have to be factored into, as an administrator, they would be factored into my pricing. So I guess the point that, that Rich and I made earlier, I made to Rich earlier, is a lot of these variables, um, you know, they, like, like all good variables, they vary. So don't, uh, don't be dissuaded um, if something seems out of reach at the time. Okay, great. I I'd like to open it up to questions. Gary had his hand up first and then David, David Leonard. So Gary, I'm gonna let you go. Okay. David, I'll get to you. Uh, George, you mentioned uh, co-housing as an option for um, aging. I, I wonder if you have some examples in the you know, PYM area of successful co-housing that includes a substantial group of uh, older folks? Well, um, the real, the, the successful Quaker co-housing that I've experienced is in Berkeley, California. Uh, there's one in Mount Airy and um, 
People have been talking for years about doing it in West Philadelphia, but um, they're very hard. Um, the only co-housing groups that work have a unifying spiritual uh, basis. So there are a lot of Zen groups do it, uh, Quaker groups do it, but you have to get everybody to agree um, on, you know, it's interesting. I was talking to a young person about conflict resolution and they said, yeah, but you know, if the other party doesn't agree that they want to resolve the conflict, then you can't do that. And I was like, exactly, <laughs> exactly. That's the, that's the catch. It's like, that's, that's why, you know, the alternatives to violence program talks about community building. So the ability to build community, to have a common ethos with which to resolve disputes um, is really important with co-housing. But um, you, can, you can Google co-housing. And if you, if you email me, I can send you some, some resources on, on co-housing. But co-housing, um, it, it takes a lot of energy. I should put it that way. Sure, it's just one of those things that's, I mean, we're settled in Kendall now, so this is not a personal issue, but it's something that's always seemed incredibly appealing to me as an option, but I just haven't seen it happen very well. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, David, you can go ahead and ask your question. If anybody else wants to ask a question, use that hand raising feature in Zoom. I mean, yeah, in Zoom, and we'll call on you. Now, first a comment and then my question. The, the comment is one of the advantages of the CCRC is that it's a, it's a perpetually rejuvenating community. Uh, in other words, people die, but also people continue to come in. And as you get older outside of a CCRC, everybody that you know starts dying. And in the end, you have no social circle left any longer. Uh, and so it's, it's something to, but anyway, my question is, George has told us he's retiring, but he hasn't told us how on earth, well, does, is his successor known? And how on earth do we get in touch with his successor <laughs> when we don't know the, na the name or even the title uh, or the email address or whatever? Uh, in other words, I, you know, please give us the, how we get in touch with your successor, George. Uh, yeah, I will. Um, I mean, I think that I think the yearly meeting is about to any day now. It's going to publish the job description, and then they'll start to, you know, hopefully bring applicants in. Um, but you know, if I'm, you know, if 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 that person is not named by the end of the year, you can always contact me, and uh, you know, I can. Is there a ge generic email for that, your position, George? Um, no. <laughs> no, there isn't. No, there isn't. That's, okay. a good, that's a good point, David. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put that down. Yeah, I just that I, I know I'm here on behalf of other people who, could, who weren't capable to be here tonight and I, they will need to be in touch with, with you. Right. Now, um, the other person you know, that I work with on the granting side is uh, Nicholas Gutowski. And, Nick, and, could you put that on the chat? So I, I don't you know, or spell it out loud. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll put it in the chat for all. And Nick, Nick is, um, you know, Nick was a student with my daughter at Germantown Friends School. So he's only 33 years old. And uh, he, uh, He's going to be available. So Nick would be the person at least to get you connected to the person who's going to be doing my. Great. And I think Nick's uh, contact information is up on the PYM website under granting groups. He is the director of granting, right? Yeah, he's, Nick is the director of grant making. So Nick, Nick assumed the position that Carol Walls had. Nick was the associate. Uh, Director of grant making and then became. Yeah, there it is. And Gutowski. Uh, Bianca, would you like to ask a question? Yes, slightly change of topic, uh, but not really. 
just a little bit more, George, I would love to hear what your favorite part of your position has been. And if there has been um, an experience that you'd like to share in which you did an event like this or um, just bestowed your wisdom upon friends that you can um, share with the group. Well, the, the greatest part of the job is calling people and telling them that they got their grant. <laughs> you know, that's the, you know, telling people that, that, you know, it's like that, that old show, you know, the millionaire who went around giving out checks, you know, so that's great. Um, I enjoy doing the, I enjoy doing the retreats. The retreats are, um, you know, this topic is you know very extensive and tried to cover it you know, using specific things. But um, the you know end of life decision making and um, you know these other topics really involve a lot of reflection. So doing the retreat, um, meetings are advised in faith and practice to um, once every other year to talk as a meeting about aging and how the meeting can support it. So um, I guess, and I, I guess another satisfactory you know, thing that's very satisfying is to be in the, in the quicker stream of this work, which as I mentioned, has been going on now for more than a hundred years. So thanks for that question, Dion. Yeah, I, th I think that makes a nice segue to end. Uh, Dave. George, I think I speak for all of us in saying this was a wonderful gift that you've given us before you leave the early meeting. We hope to see you around um, and we pray that you have a, a blessed retirement. So thank God you all you. so much. It's great being here. All right, friends. God bless everyone. See you. Uh, see you.